What's up, boys and girls? It is 10 o'clock on the 22nd day of 2020, and it is I, the Toxic Gatekeeper, the man who makes D&D no fun, the OG GM with another OG GM adventure. And today, I've noticed that there are a lot of new posts up about people saying, I want to start a D&D game, or, you know, a hat. How do you start a D&D game? What's the best advice you can start a D&D game? So I thought we'd revisit that topic because it's always a good topic and it's never a bad time to talk about that. And you'll have to forgive me for the noise without outside. The idiots are yet cutting down yet another tree. Somebody needs to stop this. These people are... Whatever. <clears throat> best advice to start a D&D or any role-playing game. Start small. Start small. Run small, enclosed adventures. They don't have to be linked. They could just be one-shots, just to get used to how everything works. You have a beginning, a middle, a twist, and an end. You should have, like, you know, two to five things that you want to happen in that four or six-hour session that have to happen to move the story along, you know. They have to go here. They have to get that. They have to kill this. They have to talk to that guy. Whatever. Everything else, you should just sort of just be open to imagination and role playing and improvisation. And remember, those two to five things don't have to happen in any chronological order. They don't. Have, it doesn't have to be A to B to C. It can be A to C to B to A to three. You know, you, you have the ability to move everything around because the players don't know. Even if you're running something that, you know, is a prepackaged module, like, you know, Descent to the Barriers of the Deep Sandwich Mines, and, you know, every player there has read Descent to the Barrier of the Deep Sandwich Mines five times, they don't know what you're going to do or what you've added or taken away. So even if they have preconceived conceptions of how the thing should go, you as the Game Master can change it any way you want. If they're supposed to go to the church to get the candles that they need to light up the unholy dungeon, and for some whatever reason they don't go to the church, don't try and railroad them and don't get locked into that they have to do this or my game is ruined mentality because chances are they won't. And if you're, you've locked yourself into that brain set that they have to do X and then they don't do X and then you find yourselves pushing against them or getting upset or flipping the table because they don't do X instead of just going, well, wait, they don't know that they have to do X. So they didn't go to the church to get the candles. I'll just put the candles to where they are going. Or I'll just have an NPC tell them, well, you know, in order to get what you need to get, you came all this way, but you need to go back to the church and get these candles. You don't have to get locked in to that. Um, that's, you know, again, the, the starting small and running small self-enclosed environments and not getting hooked into the plot has to be this. You can take that MacGuffin, that thing that you need to move the story along, and put it anywhere you want in the timeline of the story and then let them just react you know as long as the three five things in that four hour time slot happen that has to happen to move what do you think is the story along those things can happen in any order they can happen at any time and you know one or two of them maybe don't really need to happen I mean, do they really need the candles to go into the mines or you know it's like okay fine you know you chose to go into the mines without the candles okay i you know i mean you were told to get the candles you chose not to get the candles um you're going in the mine anyways and uh okay this is the effect because you chose not to go and get the candles uh you know I'm not going to tell you you can't go in the mine, but things might be a little harder because you didn't go and get the candles. And they're like, oh my god, Bill just got eaten by a giant half whale, half man, half sandwich. We better go back and get those candles. Start small. It's great that you've come up with this amazing anime-inspired super 
NPC who lives in the kingdom of flowering sunshine and raining steel and he has you know glowing sentient balls of energy that swirl around his head and they're like well we're nowhere near the kingdom of glowing steel and raining flowers and have you know so all we we care about is what's in this town what shops can we go to and um how do we go out and do our inventory stuff so don't design stuff don't get locked into the you have to make this huge, expansive Lord of the Rings critical role amazing world first time out. Start small. Run dungeons. Use pre-published materials. You've got almost 50 years of back catalog of stuff for whatever game you're running, be it D&D, &D, Space, Supers, Old West... There's tons of already stuff that's been used. You can just go, oh, okay, I'm going to run them through Keep of the Borderlands and just, you know, change a few things. So don't feel the need to create a super massive world or try and compete or be like Mercer or, you know, try and you just like start small, run small self-contained mini adventures, adventure paths. You know, this is the stuff that happens to this game and maybe it leads to the next game, maybe it doesn't, but just start small. And when it comes to NPCs, not every NPC needs to be a fleshed out, living, breathing person who's important to the world because most of them are never going to have an encounter with the player characters. Or if they do, it's going to be a one time thing. And unless the players somehow become, you know, for whatever reason, attached to that NPC, which can happen or get involved in like a grandma house scenario or a cute and fuzzy scenario. You know, that guy doesn't need to be a full, drawn-out, Shakespearean-level character. All you really need to know is, what does this guy want? What does this guy fear? And what is the one thing that makes this guy stand out? And then once they're done with the guy, whatever. You know, that's what 3 by 5 cards are for. You've written down the guy. They may meet him again. They may not. Just, again, start small. And it's okay to make mistakes. Don't let any player argue with you that you don't know the fucking rules. That's not how 5th edition works. That's not what Mercer said. You know, it's like, it's your game. Do whatever the fuck you want. Run the rules. Don't run the rules. Use the guidelines. Don't use the guidelines. If you don't want to allow goblins as a player character race or Warforge, don't. It's your world. Let them know that this is the rules of your world. That's why you have session zeros where you can just get the players all together and say, okay, I'm going to be running small. You know, I'm just starting out. This is what I'm allowing. This is what I'm not allowing. This is the kind of game I think I want to run. What do you guys want? And if they're like, oh, no, I want a bunch of goblin warforged arcanists, and you're like, I'm not going to allow that, then they're like, fuck you. Then you're like, okay, whatever, get out of my game. Find a game that will allow you to run a goblin warforged arcanist. Just, again, start small. Only, remember, only two or three things have to happen to move the game along, and everything else is just sort of improv and storytelling. And you might get your best idea in the middle of the second to last hour of the game, and suddenly the game like, takes a total shift because suddenly you're inspired by something a player said, you know, or something, there, and they're like, oh, wait, that's a great idea. I'm going to run with that. And don't get locked in. If they do something that you think totally just derails the story, don't become upset. Don't butt heads with them. Don't, don't you know, flip the table or go, oh, you just fucking ruined my campaign. Just like, okay, how can I use this? They, you know, again, they didn't go and get the thing they needed to get. So do I, but they don't know they didn't get it. So I can move it. Or, well, now they've done this, which means that's that option to the story is completely closed but what they've done is open new options and I can still run with it and still have the three things five things that I need to happen to move the game along happen I just they're gonna happen in a different order and they're gonna have it a different place and I might have to change a name or two but it doesn't matter because your players don't know and that's the greatest part about the game it's theater of the mind everything that they think and then everything that you think and then those two things meeting together to create a brand new story that nobody knew was, was expecting. 
And above all, please, please, for the love of God, do not try and compare yourself to Matt Mercer or Critical Role. In fact, the best information I can probably give a Dungeon Master right now is don't watch Critical Role. Don't set yourself up. Don't deal with players who come to you and say, I want my game to be exactly like Critical Role. Because only Matt Mercer can run Critical Role. And only the players in Matt Mercer's game can make Critical Role work the way it works. It is a miraculously strange conglomeration of hundreds of different talents and millions of hours and lots of crap that, you know, your game is going to be completely different because your players are completely different and you are not Matt Mercer, so don't set yourself up. And, again, start small. Talk to you later, losers!